Thank you so much, Evan, and now Simon. Simon Schaffer will talk about uh, history of science put back on the map. Ideas about how I got the full picture of that one. One to the right. Bravo. Good morning, everyone. I'm just checking. Good. Um, so that was the title that I uh, invented when Menachem, not exactly out of the blue, but rather out of the turquoise, sent me a message saying, not only are you going to have to describe the future of your discipline, which as we know, and for reasons Rainey has eloquently adumbrated, is toxic for an historian, but you actually have to think of a title for your prediction. Um, put back is the key phrase in my title. History of Science put back on the map, and I'll explain why in a moment. Brutus's great mistake, as those of you who've recently, like me, seen Julius Caesar, was to agree that Mark Antony could talk second. I have exactly the opposite problem. Because my name begins with a letter late in the alphabet, you already know the answer to the question Menachem has posed, and you know it much, much better than anything that I could possibly discuss now. So I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to talk about the future of history of science. I'm going to talk about the future of the history of science. That's the other qualification. So let me start with this image, and it's become very familiar to you. And in case you were persuaded by Rainey that that limited map characterized only the moment when we were both in graduate school, if this is the image of the disciplinary scope of the history of science, let's do a little experiment. Let's put this image on a map. Now, on the image, you have Raphael's School of Athens in the background. Can you see that? Bravo. And then, in roughly this chronological order, Pythagoras, Archimedes, Newton, who gets both the Experimentum Crucis in optics and William Whiston's diagram of the solar system, and a sexton. That's why he has three stations on Rainey's tube map. Okay. Then Darwin, Pasteur, Mendel, and of course some peas. You can't have Mendel without peas. Marie Curie. Alexander Fleming, Barbara McClintock, and Rita Levy Montalcini. That is how the history of science is represented here. Okay, now let's put that on the map. That's what it looks like. It's divided into two zones. The ancients, who live on the shores of the Ionian Sea, and the moderns, who more or less precisely occupy the zone that Rainey and I were taught back in the 1970s and 80s. And that seems very interesting to me. This is not a criticism of that image. It's rather an evocation of the sensibility that informs images like that for the purposes they discharge. And I hope to talk briefly enough to give us time to think about what those purposes and interests might be. Now, contrast this with another map. This is also a highly interested map. This map was made by the Royal Society of London about four years ago in order to defend British science against ferocious budgetary cuts imposed by what's laughingly known as our government. The point of this map is 
to show, as you see the key in the bottom right, the number of science papers produced by local institutions. Right? And you're supposed to be struck by two things. One is you're supposed to be struck by the global, patchy admittedly, but global extent of natural scientific and medical production. But in particular, you're supposed to be struck, if you live in Whitehall, by the immense productivity of British scientific authors in comparison with anywhere else with the possible exceptions of Tokyo and New York. Got it? So don't cut our budget. That's what this map says. But what I want to make us think about a little is the contrast between that map and this one, right? And how we move in our field between exactly as Rainey and Evelyn have so well evoked already, thinking that universe and thinking this one. Because what lies behind this one, and I'll go right to the end of my presentation, leaving out all that, is this. This is last year, or the end of 16, beginning of 17, um, Nature in a review of Chinese um, scientific investment and productivity made this graph, which I find completely fascinating, so I'm going to leave it up for a bit, which is the number of collaborations between Chinese science research groups and groups based in other nation states. Right? Um, the size, sorry, the diameter, I should say, of the circle is the measures the number of co collaborations. So you see uh, China, US collaborations basically swamp all others. And you can't, I guess, on this image, but if you look closely, perhaps you can, each of the arcs linking the two circles together, linking China with the remote circle is broken at a particular point and that tells you very interestingly for my current work the degree to which the collaboration is dominated or not by Chinese participants. So if the arrow is broken near to China that means most co collaborators are foreign. If it's broken remotely from China it means most collaborators are based in China. Right? And what's interesting is that it's near parity in the case of Chinese-American collaborations and way, way over on the Chinese side in the case of Chinese-European collaborations. So these are collaborations massively dominated by Chinese scientists. But I'll, I'll leave that up so, so you can meditate on it. Now, why is any of this relevant? Well, you already heard why any of this is relevant. While the history of science for the last three generations has been dominated by the shibboleth and working principle of an anti-anachronistic program, a program that wishes precisely to understand the past and the exotic in its own terms, which akin to Novalis's definition of romantic poetics wants to make the exotic familiar and the familiar exotic, that was what we were all doing. Anachronism, nevertheless, dominates and ought to dominate, it seems to me, the agenda of this tiny sub-discipline. As Evelyn has already said, it seems to me that unless and until historians of the sciences are engaged with where the sciences are, then they are not really writing the genealogy of the sciences at all. And that engagement, above all, I would argue, has to form part of our own disciplinary training, which is going to be the burden of what I'll talk about for the balance of this address. Excuse me. Because the great problem during my career as an historian of science has always been how to train folk, how to work with and train aspiring members of our small and imperfectly formed and highly heterogeneous community. Issues like the balance to be struck 
between training in the methods of hermeneutics, of the humanities, and of philology, which have always seemed indispensable to historical studies of the sciences, and expertise in and command of the broad range of scientific disciplines, that in all sorts of ways has seemed to me to be the nub of where the history of science as an organized activity, rather than some kind of avocation, must be. And if history of science as the historical study of and engagement with the sciences has any future whatsoever, the future it must have seems to me to be almost entirely determined by its capacity to work out effective and robust ways of disciplining its members. In other words, inviting them into a community with the range of interpretative, philological and scientific tools which are prerequisites for the kind of work that we credit and which is worthwhile and which would be resourced. Because make no mistake about it, and I know that I'm speaking here, as we say in English, I'm preaching to the choir, right? I'm speaking, I imagine, to people who have enormous experience of this. If an enterprise like the history of science has a future, its future completely, or at least almost completely, depends on the survival of a small group of characteristic institutions in which work like that has up till now been pursued. Those institutions are extraordinarily fragile, extremely badly resourced, many of them under threat, several of them no longer exist, many of them, it seems to me, in all sorts of institutional crises. So the question that Menachem has posed can we reflect on the future of the history of science as an enterprise, if we're thinking about the Ray scripta rather than the Ray's gestar aspects of this enterprise, is an urgent and difficult and challenging task. Can we work out ways of legitimating and explaining why historical engagement with the sciences is so important? And can we work out how discipline in both its senses, that is to say, discipline is a form of organizing knowledge and discipline is a form of regular training, can actually secure the place of this enterprise. Now, why would we want to do that? Well, like my two uh, magnificent co-laureates, uh, the only answer I've got to this is to go backwards. I would go back to 1781, obviously, when it all began. The issue of discipline is always already, I would argue, a question of geography. It's a question of mapping. It's a question precisely, as Rainey put it, of that she had very trenchant criticisms, remember, of this a uh, way of defining the scope of the field. It's a way of extending the methods of cartographic geography to the realm of knowledge. Now, the most famous, if not notorious, exercise in this was a German geography professor, that was his job, writing in 1781, um, who puts the question like this, and this is Menachem's question. We have now, I'll read it out because even in English, I mean, it's better in German, right? But even in English, it's an extraordinary manifesto. We have not only traversed the region and surveyed every part of it. We have also measured it and assigned to everything therein its proper place. But this land is an island and it is enclosed by nature within unchangeable limits. It is a land surrounded by a wide and stormy ocean, where many a fog bank, many an iceberg, seems to the mariner on their voyage of discovery a new country, and while constantly deluding them with vain hopes, engages them in dangerous adventures from which they can never desist, and yet never can bring to a termination. But, 
but that's where we are. But before venturing on this sea in order to explore it in its whole extent and to arrive at a certainty whether anything is to be discovered there, it won't be without advantage if we cast our eyes on the chart, the map of the land that we are about to leave and ask ourselves firstly whether we can't rest perfectly content with what it contains, whether we must not of necessity be content with it if we can find nowhere else a solid foundation to build on. So basically, why bother? And secondly, this is the killer question, of course, by what title we possess this land itself and how we hold it secure against all hostile claims. Now, as you know, that's the great definition of the function of transcendental critique in the first critique, and it's Kant who's writing. He's writing about nine months after reading Georg Forster's description of Cook's voyage into the Southern Ocean, and he literally means, as well as figuratively, that we are engaged in a cartographic exercise in a foggy, ice-bound ocean like them, like Cook and Forster and the mariners on the splendidly named Resolution, Adventure and Discovery. So the relation between the disciplinary definition of the very task that history of science, it seems to me, has ever since posed itself, which is colonial and geographic and cartographic in principle. The questions are, why do we, and then the definition of we becomes moot, why do we venture out into this stormy, illusory, delusive, icebound and foggy sea? And on the other hand, why do we legitimately control the knowledge the realm of reason that we believe the sciences, above all, in Kant's case, the Newtonian sciences have given us, those have been the questions that history and philosophy of science within a certain tradition has posed ever since. And so it's for that reason, it seems to me, that we need to pay renewed and re-energised attention to putting the history of the sciences back on the kind of map that is in place there to see that this is more than metaphorical, that there was something absolutely fundamental about the moment, the situation, the conjuncture with its highly gendered, its highly colonial language that was in play, yet at the same time to understand the ambition and the disciplinary definition that that Kantian enterprise and its avatars and its successors would develop. And it's for that reason then, this is my first point, that it seems to me an attention to something like the relation between ideology and training is going to be fundamental for the future of our field at all, and in particular its relation with the contemporary in the sciences. The second point has also been made much better than I could ever do which is the relationship between a disciplinary map and the notion of the global, which, as you saw from both previous speakers, plays an increasingly regulative role in our field. So from the same Royal Society report from which uh, the output map was taken, this is the disciplinary map that the Royal Society produced just a few years ago. Um, this is a map of co-citations across disciplinary fields. Magnificently, there's an annotation in the report, which I couldn't fit on the slide, which is a bit of a bummer, really, because it's a wonderful annotation. And this is what the annotation says. Mathematical material is cited so often in all these papers that the reader is to assume that the entire space occupied by this map is, in fact, mathematics. That was a desperate effort to get funding for maths from the government, right? We can't put, put it on the map, so you're to imagine that it's everywhere, right? Now, it will 
There is so much to say about this map if you're an historian of science and, and if you're a scientific practitioner. I point to three things which are going to be important for the balance of my talk. One is the fantastic isolation of physics. The extraordinary isolation of physics in the early 21st century. Right? This map would be completely different exactly for the reasons Evelyn gave um, if you went back 50 or 60 years. But on this map, physicists basically don't cite anybody else. Occasionally, they engage with computers and material scientists and engineers, but basically, they're completely autarkic. Compare and contrast uh, what I learned this morning is um, the science of wind, a Geisterswissenschaft, um, which is mainly towards the southwest of the map, um, which is heavily invested in business and management, in health and social issues, in psychology and cognitive science. And one could say a lot about why that disciplinary development happened over the last roughly two or three decades and its consequences and significance. Where one would put, it would be tiny, so not on the map, um, the history of science in this map, I think is a very, very interesting question to ask. But one of the things that the various reports I'm drawing on here indicate is the extremely intriguing relationship between the two maps that I've shown you. In other words, the global map of scientific output and the disciplinary map of co-citation. Because what the disciplinary map of co-citation does is essentially to wreck that rather simple northern hemispheric picture of scientific output. There are very, very weak correlations between intensities of citation and global positioning. So that finally then takes me to what I take to be the other theme of the uh, question, which is its relation with the global. Now, as Rainey said, over breakfast, we chatted. I'm sorry you weren't all there, actually, because that would really have raised the tone at the Dan Hotel a lot. Right? Uh, and the breakfast at the Dan Hotel is one of the many things for which I'm extraordinarily grateful. Uh, are just remarkable. So I, next time, right? Um, over breakfast, we were talking about the semantics of words like science, Geisterswissenschaft, and so on. Global, of course, is an extraordinarily interesting word, semantically, for the future of the history of science. Global erupted into the English language in the late 1800s, from French, of course. And what it meant was shaped like this planet. That's what it meant, so roughly spherical, magnificently, one, as one might immediately observe as an historian of science. The global appears as a term precisely at the moment when science shows that the globe is not in fact global. And up till then, soap bubbles were global, right? and the planet was global, and then it wasn't, and then the word global was invented to describe that. Great. The very first use of the word global in English, of which I'm aware, is magnificently in the 1880s. It was introduced from a French financial journal. It was in The Economist. And it was to describe one thing that The Economist loathed, a global income tax. That is the first use of the word global in English that doesn't simply mean shaped like a ball. From then on, global and its cognates become a hugely significant trope in histories and politics of knowledge. The word dominates, as is well known, the great enterprises of the interwar period in European culture to construct and reconstruct new kinds of international order. Paul Otle, uh, Warburg, Otto Neurath, all use global and its cognates. 
uh, Paul Lockley, the great Belgian visionary socialist U utopian, who coins the French word mondial uh, to capture some aspects of this. In other words, the history of the concept global has a great deal to tell us, I think, about the way in which the history of the sciences de developed. It isn't a term that kind of enters the discipline of history of science from the outside, almost the opposite. But, and this is, I think, a very important point, at least it's a very important point for Anglophones, and you'll be able afterwards to tell me whether this applies in Ivrit, um, the English speaker is completely banjaxed by the fact that we do not have a distinction which exists in almost all Romance languages between global and mondial. So work, word, works like those of Jean-Luc Nancy or Serge Guzinski in French uh, make an absolutely fundamental distinction, distinction which is really crucial, I think, for the future of history of science between the global and the global and the mondial. Um, there is no English word for mondialisation. Worldification, I'm not sure how one would do that. But, and what is that distinction? It's a distinction between progressive regulatory standardisation, that's globalisation, and networked cultivation of connected idiosyncratic difference, that's mondialisation. It's roughly, this is a bad mnemonic, but try this. It's roughly the difference between McDonald's, that's globalization, and couscous, that's mondialization. Even I, in a provincial town in eastern England, can now get, extraordinarily, a particular Moroccan couscous. In the olden days, couscous was tended to be stacked in, on the same shelf as other laundry products, right? which it astonishingly resembled. Now you can actually buy effectively appellation contrôlé couscous, <laughs> even in Cambridge. Right? So that's mondialisation. And globalisation, I think we understand what that is. Why is that so important for the future of history of science? Because it's a way of beginning to articulate the most important issue, which is the one that Rainey has put on the table for our discussion, the boundaries and disciplinary issues around what happens when the constriction of this map is relaxed. What can we possibly do to control and orient the kind of work that our trained collaborators and students will pursue? We simply, as she put it, and invite everyone to the party. Well, we're not going to invite everyone to the party. It would be great if the beavers turn up, obviously, but it would be nice if we had a taxonomy and a form of discipline, I think, which could control the sets of questions that we're asking. And the way to do that will involve, I predict, working out the dialectic between something like progressive, more universal, more delocalized, standardized regulation on the one hand, and highly networked, specific forms of local idiosyncrasy on the other. So, I've now used up my time. Let me conclude. First of all, to reiterate what I and my fellow laureates feel, which is this is an extraordinary recognition and I personally feel completely unworthy of it, um, to such an extent that, as I've already told uh, our hosts and patrons, when I received the phone call, I thought it was one of my students playing a joke. Um, nevertheless, as a recognition of the possible significance and virtue of the discipline that the three of us practice in our own ways, uh, I think this is a remarkable moment, and we should seize it in important political and institutional ways. So massive gratitude and massive respect. Secondly, I've insisted that high on the agenda of any discussion of the future of the field must be an attention to legitimating the resources the field needs 
and interrogating and reorganizing, if necessary, the way in which we collaborate and train with those people who we wish to recruit and work with in our field. Uh, it's not just that, as one says, they are the future, and one of the strengths of the Dan David project is precisely its orientation towards students and people who are still at school. But I, for one, am massively, massively convinced of the virtues of what's called in English um, teaching-led research. In other words, it is precisely through instruction that the research agenda is forged, as well as the other way around. And I've also wanted us to think together about the sense of the global, which is increasingly characterized a vast and burgeoning area of work in the field of history of science, but which is in desperate need of remapping and redisciplining in that other sense of discipline. And perhaps if we could translate mondialisation into uh, American, that would help a bit. Uh, thank you very much indeed.